Welcome to the Health Channel, all health, all the time. I'm Kathy Buccio, coming to you from the Baptist Health South Florida studios. Every year, millions of people in the U.S. suffer brain injuries. And on our Brain Health Show, we are focusing on traumatic brain injury. It can happen from a violent blow or a jolt to the head, and the injuries can result in long-term complications or even death. Here to talk about this is Dr. Lucinda Adriana Arenas, a physical medicine and rehabilitation physician at Baptist Health South Florida. Welcome to the show. Welcome back to the show, I should say, Dr. Arenas, Thanks. for having you. Yes, thank you for having me again. Now, we have a lot to talk about, so let's jump right into the topic, which is traumatic brain injury. So when someone says traumatic brain injury, what are you referring to? Traumatic brain injury is a disruption to the normal function of the brain, usually caused by external forces that could be either a penetrating object to the, to the brain from a bullet, for instance, or it could be uh, from a violent blow to the head, right. uh, such as what happens in car accidents or falls. And we're gonna get into just how big a problem this is, but as we continue our conversation on traumatic brain injury, I just wanna take a moment to let our viewers know you can call in if you have a question. The toll-free number is 855-796-4475. We'd love to hear from you. Now, as a physical medicine and rehabilitation physician, how do you help? So as a physiatrist or rehabilitation doctors, we are actually, uh, we are able to get uh, extremely involved uh, with the care of these patients after the acute event. Uh, with patients and families, uh, basically the main goal of for, phys for physiatrists or rehab physicians uh, for these patients is to, one, try to uh, improve quality of life, and also to try to bring them back to a previous level of function right. as soon as possible. Uh, it's a very challenging and sometimes frustrating situation, and we have different cases. We have some cases that can be very devastating, but as well, at the same time, we have also very rewarding cases with amazing recoveries. What is it that makes it challenging? I mean, I, as I'm not a physician, but I can imagine not just emotionally and physically, but mentally, there's so many things that are going on as you're trying to overcome this, um, this situation. Yes, uh, again, the main challenge for us is uh, we have to deal with all the deficits that patients present after the injury, especially in the severe uh, traumatic brain injuries, but also we have to um, deal a lot with the family situation nice. in terms of education and guidance. Uh, because it's a whole new situation uh, either for the patient and also for, uh, for the family members. Now let's go over some of the tra traumatic brain injury statistics. These are important to mention. Uh, can you talk a little bit about these, Dr. Arenas? Yes, uh, so trauma is one of the uh, leading causes of death in uh, ages 1 to 44. Uh, specifically ages, I would probably say 25 to 35, because this is the time when, where people are more exposed to, for instance, car accidents. Mm -hmm. uh, of all the trauma, probably more than half of the cases are gonna be related to head injury. And mortality uh, from head trauma is um, highly increased in the neurological setting. So motor car, motor vehicle accidents are uh, the cause number one uh, for traumatic brain injury, probably followed by violence or gunshot wounds. And uh, falls are the cause number one after 65 years. Mm -hmm. uh, the, 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 uh, these, uh, these causes are a little bit different in the pediatric population, for instance. We have number one, uh, car-related accidents as well, and number two, falls, sometimes related to child abuse right. and sports-related. Alcohol is obviously and clearly related to uh, traumatic brain injury because of the driving and, and drinking. Now, when, when you talk about a brain injury that's caused from a motor, motor vehicle accident, is it because seatbelts weren't worn? Uh, well, uh, one of the important things to know is that the single most common cause of death in car accidents is the ejection of the occupant from the vehicle. Right. So. Uh, and that is true. Uh, the the seatbelts is an, is an important aspect to have in mind uh, because it could lead eventually to, to a severe traumatic brain injury. But have the mortality, mortality, mortality I'm sorry, rates themselves, have they been declining? 
Lately, the good thing is, yes, the mortality rates due to traumatic brain injury have, uh, uh, have declined, uh, probably because of two reasons. One, uh, people are more conscious uh, about the texting and driving, drinking and driving, and also they tend to use more safety devices such as seat belts. Mm -hmm. And the other cause is because uh, the cars now have improved safety equipment, right. such as airbags and other features that uh, have helped to decrease the, the incidence. Dr. Mm -hmm. let me ask you, is there a relationship between mortality and age when it comes to traumatic brain injury? Um, you, it is. It is. It's not like a, like a clear and cut, uh, you know, answer. But uh, mortality is supposed to increase as increase age. So right. the older the patient, probably the higher the mortality. Does it also mean, as we explained, with having better vehicles or more people wearing seatbelts, that brain tra a traumatic brain injury is something that can be prevented? It is. It is preventable, and especially later on when we talk a little bit about the uh, secondary mechanisms as well. Uh, but in general, it's, it's preventable because of all these mm -hmm. um, safety measurements, yes. So what type of, when we talk about sports as well, mm -hmm. and this one that we mentioned, especially with younger kids, what kind are we seeing with traumatic brain injury? Uh, so the most common sports that we see related to traumatic brain injury are football, mm -hmm. uh, soccer, uh, skateboarding and basketball. Uh, but for traumatic brain injury, uh, remember, it's not only the type of a sport, but it's really more the continuous and repetitive minor injuries. Which is like football with CTE. Exactly, mm -hmm. that happen over time okay. and can eventually lead to what we call concussion, which is the same as, as something that we call mild right. traumatic brain injury. Now, I want to go back really quickly to CTE, if you can explain a little bit of what CTE is, because since it has been sort of in the mainstream, uh, it's, it's been brought to light recently with football injuries, and this is something that, unfortunately, we don't know about until after this individual passes and, and the brain is studied. Right. It's uh, more all the um, con concussion mm -hmm. syndrome that uh, eventually, and if it persists with the symptoms, can lead to what we call a post-concussion post syndrome. Um, and it's all these uh, cascade of events that happen in the inner structures of the brain that eventually might lead to a poor performance, uh, cognitive right. most of all, in the person. Now recently on the Health Channel, Dr. Brad Herskowitz, a neurologist and medical director, explains what happens to the brain during a high velocity collision. Let's take a look. Well, you can see uh, there's things you can and you can't see. So the cascade of events that occur in concussion, you can not see, and those are the neurons that are affected. That's a microscopic level. What you can see sometimes is the, the areas that are most vulnerable uh, to injury are the frontal aspect and the temporal aspect. So when the, when, the, when the brain moves inside the skull, you can actually damage the brain against the skull, and that's called a coup contra coup injury. And you can see uh, hematomas and contusions actually in the brain from these types of injuries. That's a really powerful image there. So, um, Dr. Arenas, would you say that most of the traumatic brain injuries that we see are from car accidents? Yes. So, what happens in car accidents or high velocity impacts is uh, there are forces from acceleration, disacceleration, and rotational forces mm -hmm. that are going to affect the inner parts of the brain, and that's what we see in the severe traumatic brain injuries. And one of, one, that's one of the mechanisms uh, that we'll talk about a little bit later uh, to explain what happens really inside the brain when these, um, when these acceleration and disacceleration forces happen. Can damage from a traumatic brain injury ever be reversed? Uh, there's a couple of uh, mechanisms that could be eventually be uh, reversed with time. Uh, for instance, like the swelling, especially right. the secondary events that happen. But uh, some others, like the primary, are probably going to be there for a long time. 
Now, coming up, we're talking about the mechanisms of traumatic brain injury, which means the cause of the injury and the damage involved. So stay tuned. You're watching the Health Channel, all health, all the time, on South Florida PBS. If you have a question, please call in now using the toll-free number 855-796-4475. And remember, you can take the Health Channel wherever you go by visiting our website, allhealthtv.com. You can watch a Health Channel live stream or check out videos from previous episodes. We'll be right back. A concussion is a type of traumatic brain injury, or TBI, caused by a bump, blow, or jolt to the head, or by a hit to the body that causes your head and brain to move rapidly back and forth. This sudden movement can literally cause the brain to bounce around or twist in the skull, stretching and damaging the brain cells and creating chemical changes in the brain. What you might not know is that these chemical changes make the brain more sensitive to any increased stress or injury until it fully recovers. Hey everybody, this is Gavin DeGraw. I've seen firsthand the effects of pancreatic cancer. My mother, who was considered very healthy, is diagnosed with stage four pancreatic cancer. I first heard about Lust Garden right after my mother was diagnosed. It's a great organization. 100% of the money goes specifically to cancer research. They know what they're doing. They really can help. I encourage everybody to get involved with the Lust Garden Foundation. Kind of happy hour. This is my kind of fast lane. This is my kind of personal trainer. My kind of joy ride. My kind of nightlife. Whether you're just finding your stride or making the golden years look good, Florida Blue goes beyond health insurance, investing in the health and communities of all Floridians so you can feel good saying, that's my kind of blue. This is my kind of blue. This is my kind of blue. This is my kind of blue. Welcome back to the Health Channel, all health, all the time. I'm Kathy Buccio, and we're talking about traumatic brain injuries with Dr. Lucinda Adriana Arenas, a physical medicine and rehabilitation physician at Baptist Health South Florida. I want to remind our viewers to call in if you have a question. That number is 855-796-4475. Now, traumatic brain injury often results from a fall or car accident and requires serious treatment and rehabilitation. Mm -hmm. And we have some images of the brain. And, and Dr. Arenas, will you explain what we're looking at here exactly? So what we're trying to explain here with these um, drawings is about the primary and the secondary mechanisms of what happens in brain injury after the trauma. So if we have the uh, brain in the upper left side, which is a normal brain if you look it through the, through the side, mm -hmm. uh, you have the frontal areas or lobes, the occipital lobes and the temporal lobes. So the red uh, circles that uh, we marked 
specifically in the inferior parts of the uh, frontal lobe and the anterior part of the temporal lobes. That's when the primary, one of the primary mechanisms of brain injury is gonna happen regardless of the site of the injury in the head. And even with the low velocity impact, such as falls, this is gonna happen, and it's contusions and lacerations in those areas of the brain. Now, does it, does where your injury in the brain, does that determine where you're gonna lose function or where you lose that mobility? That is gonna determine just the primary mechanism, but eventually the deficits that the patient might have could be in some other different parts of the brain. Okay, I wanna bring that graphic back up, uh, Dr. Adena, I understand mm -hmm. that we were just finishing, finishing up the, the, our last image. Yes, so in the lower part, we have the brain, if you cut it uh, in the middle, mm -hmm. just to show the most inner parts of the brain uh, that are responsible for the loss of consciousness. And this is what happens pretty much in severe traumatic brain injuries. Uh, the red lines are actually drawing that inner parts. Because uh, when you have um, high velocity impacts like car accidents and happens to severe traumatic brain injuries, patients uh, have what we call diffuse axonal injury. That diffuse axonal injury happens in the inner structures of the brain are responsible for the loss of consciousness. And um, pretty much what happens in diffuse axonal injury is if you have the uh, neuron, which is the, the brain cell. The brain cell has the body and like kind of a tail, which is the axon. That axon is responsible for the transportation of nutrients from the periphery to the body of the cell. So when the diffuse axonal injury happens, the axon has a lot of swelling and even it detaches from the body of the cell. That transportation is gonna be interrupted and at the end, the cell is gonna die. This is what happens uh, when, when you have a severe traumatic brain injury. So those are uh, the main primary uh, mechanisms of injury after with traumatic uh, brain injuries. And are there secondary problems as well, like swelling maybe around the exactly. injury that interferes with brain function? Exactly, so secondary mechanisms happen uh, after the primary, as it says later, they are delayed, and that's why they are supposed to be preventable because they occur probably hours and even up to 10 days after the injury. And they include swelling, they include um, decreased uh, blood flow to the brain, decreased uh, oxygenation to the brain. Uh, brain is gonna be exposed to uh, possible uh, infections and even seizures. Um, and uh, significant edema and, and swelling of the brain happens. Alterations in the glucose. Remember, glucose is one of the main nutrients of the brain, and it's gonna be either increased or decreased as well in the secondary uh, mechanism. Now we have a story from a mom named Linda whose daughter suffered a concussion in a high school basketball game. And Linda warns that keeping quiet about the concussion can do more than keep your child out of the game. Let's take a look. Tracy suffered a, a concussion in a basketball game in January of 2005. When Tracy's injury happened, it didn't just happen to her, it happened to the whole family. What a lot of people don't realize about concussions is just how serious it can change your life. It's been over three and a half years already, and she is still struggling with dizziness and having problems reading. She's been hospitalized so many times, I couldn't even tell you how many, what we're at, what, what number we're at as far as emergency visits and hospital visits. The good news is, three and a half years later, there, there is progress, so there is hope. Uh, but one of the most important things is, is to educate people so that no one else would need to go through this again. The most important thing that I would ask any parent to consider, if they do have a child that has a concussion or they think may have a concussion, please take a step back and make sure you're doing the right thing for the athlete and for your child. Get them to a doctor right away. Get them help. No scoreboard is that important. No win or loss is that important. We really need to make the right decisions for them. As I'm watching Linda's story, Dr. Arenas, I, I remember the story of Natasha Richardson, mm -hmm. the actress who was skiing and, and fell and hit her head. And Trauma. same 
story where the medical attention wasn't seeked right away. Right. And how often does this happen? How important is to get that medical attention when you have a head injury? It's very important, actually. So remember, concussion is the same as mild traumatic brain injury. And patients might have no symptoms or very, very few symptoms. And that's why sometimes just they just go home and a few days later they start appearing a lot of uh, symptoms related to the trauma. So it is important to be checked uh, by, a, by a neurologist or a doctor who knows about uh, the condition. Uh, to seek uh, eventually more uh, checkups, follow-ups, and eventually treatment right. if needed. So if a patient or individual goes to the ER because they've suffered a, a, a head injury, what kind of tests are done to determine if there is damage? So they take, uh, they have a lot of, um, they have a very throughout evaluation in the ER because that there is where they're going to be able to say, okay, this traumatic brain injury was either mild, moderate, or severe. Of course, the mild, uh, the moderate and the severes are going to stay in the hospital. So those are the ones that get more attention. Uh, but what happens with the mild TBIs or the concussions, they usually go home. But that's when, you know, family members need to be um, on top of the, of the situation, uh, checking the patient constantly for any changes in symptomatology, like headaches or dizziness, hearing problems, visual problems, and take uh, the person to the doctor at least every two or three months for the first six months after the injury, just to make sure that is they, they clear all the symptoms. Right. So if it's mild, you're looking at maybe something that goes away or the swelling goes down on its own? So if it's mild, patients can probably have uh, none or just transitory loss of consciousness, a little bit of amnesia that they don't remember, a couple of things, um, and uh, some symptoms related po with uh, poor sleep and irritability. Mm -hmm. Uh, I want to bring a graphic up, Dr. Arenas. Like I believe that. we have the common symptoms of a mild yes. traumatic brain injury. Okay. And as you said, there's memory loss. So transitory memory mm -hmm. loss, a uh, couple of visual, uh, visual uh, problems, headaches, fatigue, poor attention, sleep. I will probably add some uh, irritability, okay. uh, hearing, hearing problems as well that they can present, but remember, if it's a mild traumatic brain injury, all these symptoms are usually uh, gonna clear up by three months. Okay. If they persist, then we have something that is called post-concussion syndrome, or even something that we call post-traumatic stress disorder. And then those entities might need different type of approach and, and treatment. Those are more severe cases, Those correct? are more severe cases, yes. Most of the time, like, I will probably say 90% of the times by three months, the concussions, the mild traumatic brain injuries, they cleared the symptoms, which is, which is good. And one of the symptoms was visual disturbances. When you, is it a loss of vision? Is it more of a blurriness? What's, what happens? It's more, of, uh, it's more of blurriness and probably um, they have more uh, sensitivity to the lights. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's pretty much what happens with the visual symptoms. And is it true you can lose your sense of smell? You could lose, that's uh, actually a, a frequent uh, complaint of patients, really? depending on, on the part of the brain that was affected. So the smell part is located usually in the, in the lower portions of the frontal lobes. Uh, so if that area was, uh, was uh, injured, they can present problems with the smell and taste as well. Wow. Now, Dr. Nett, is it easy to miss or diagnose a mild dramatic brain injury? Because sometimes someone may not have all the symptoms and they might be moving around. So maybe it's right. often thought, oh, they're okay. Right. It, it, it could be missed and that's why they need to be checked um, soon by a doctor and probably to have periodic follow-ups and make sure that nothing happened along with radiological findings. The mild traumatic brain injuries have a normal radiology, normal CTs, normal MRIs, the moderate and the severe, then you have some findings in the radiology. And is it usually the family members 
that notice that there's something off. I mean, uh, maybe you yourself may not see there's there's a situation, but the family members could say, hmm, something's right. not right here. Most of the time, it's family members and also teachers from the school. You know, they sometimes complain about the student that probably has poor attention in the class, is more irritable, uh, something's going on. So those are the people that probably are going to notice first. And is this an old wives' tale? You always hear that when someone has a concussion, you don't let them go to sleep. Is this true? Well, basically, it's not because if they go to sleep, they get worse. It's just it's because they go to sleep, nobody's going to be able really to notice if something happens in the first few hours um, of, the, of the injury. Now, when are you asked to evaluate a patient? We, as physiatrists, are asked to evaluate the patients uh, basically in two settings. One is in the uh, very acute uh, stage when the patients are in the intensive care unit. Uh, just to give more uh, feedback and advice on prevention mm -hmm. of potential complications that eventually when they are moved to the rehabilitation unit, we want to avoid. And then uh, once the patient is medically stable, be able to speak, be able to move, we are going to transfer that patient to the acute rehabilitation unit and we come on board with all the rest of the team. Thank you for that, doctor. Now coming up, we'll get a closer look at the recovery process and the different states of consciousness. So stay tuned. You're watching the Health Channel. All health, all the time on South Florida PBS. If you have a question, please call in now using the toll-free number 855-796-4475. And remember, you can take the Health Channel wherever you go by visiting our website, allhealthtv.com. You can watch a Health Channel live stream or check out videos from previous episodes. We'll be right back. A brain aneurysm doesn't care that you have important meetings. It doesn't care that you have to drop your daughter off at ballet and your son off at soccer practice. So if you suddenly experience the worst headache of your life, sharp pain behind your eye, and blurry vision, seek immediate emergency care. The Lisa Calagrassi Foundation, shedding light on brain aneurysms. Learn more at lisafoundation.org. I am a father and a husband. I'm a professional golfer. I am a colon cancer survivor. And I fight because I want people to survive what they're going through and live long, happy lives. It's the second leading cause of death of any cancer. Probably something most folks don't know. But it's, it's also one of the most treatable forms of cancer. So you can prevent this by proactively doing things about it. And many times you're going to find out that it's be a lifesaver to do that. If you're like me, when you have the flu, <clears throat> you don't want to go anywhere. And when your kid has it too, ugh, life is just awful. And why should you go anywhere? And you'll probably feel better just staying in bed anyway. That's why Baptist Health's Care on Demand is so crucial. Care right from your bed. How are you feeling today? Yeah, we've been sick for a couple days now. I can even get my prescriptions ordered through my care provider after my visit. Hey, hon, could you pick that up at the pharmacy on your way home? And it's care right away, not hours of driving in the car and then sitting in a waiting room. Because when I have the flu, there's only one thing I feel like doing. Dementia is not a specific disease. It's an overall term that describes a wide range of symptoms associated with a declining memory or other thinking skills, severe enough to reduce a person's ability to perform everyday activities. While symptoms of dementia can vary greatly, at least two of the following must be significantly impaired to be considered dementia. Memory, communication and anguish, ability to pay attention, reasoning and judgment, visual perception. If you feel like you or someone in your family might be experiencing these symptoms, contact your primary care physician so that an evaluation can be performed. I 
am thankful that I'm here today. I think routine checkups are very important because if you do have factors as high cholesterol or high blood pressure, those are factors that can contribute to a heart attack. Miami Cardiac and Vascular Institute saved my life. Welcome back to the Health Channel, all health, all the time. I'm Kathy Buccio, and we're talking about traumatic brain injuries with Dr. Lucinda Adriana Arenas, a physical medicine and rehabilitation physician at Baptist Health South Florida. I want to remind our viewers to call in if you have a question for the doctor. That number is 855-796-4475. We'd love to hear from you. Now, the U.S. Transportation Department calls a distracted driving a dangerous epidemic. Every day in America, at least eight people are killed and more than 1,000 are injured in crashes that are reported to involve a distracted driver. The Mayo Clinic has more. Just text him. Deb is about to find out how distraction 30364 can prove deadly. <gasps> You have been convicted of the crime. People are usually shocked. Mayo Clinic Injury Prevention Coordinator Kim Lombard says this distracted driving simulator is an eye-opener. Generally, people are like, I'm never going to text and drive, <laughs> is really what we're hearing. The simulator highlights three main types of driving distractions. Visual distraction takes your eyes off the road. Manual takes your hands off the wheel. And cognitive distraction is something that takes your mind off driving. Texting, however, is one that involves all three of those distractions. And they're longer than you might think. Highway safety officials say five seconds is the average time your eyes are off the road while texting. At 55 miles an hour, that's enough time to travel the length of a football field. Which can definitely result in a crash occurring. This simulator proves it. Can you use your phone and call my boss? And hopefully prevents it, too. It comes down to behavior change and what are simple things you can do to make sure that you're driving safe. Now, with patients from all sorts of backgrounds and injuries, how do you first assess a patient's need for rehab? Because everybody comes with a different plan, correct? Right. So when we assess the patient uh, for rehab uh, in the acute uh, rehab unit, we have all the team on board, involved. Uh, everybody has different um, jobs to do with each case. And then patients start doing intensive rehabilitation program that's basically uh, going to be six days a week, uh, Monday to Saturday, twice a day. And we have all the disciplines on board to work with the specific uh, needs and deficits that the patients have. So during rehab, the brain is repairing itself? basically, and how does it do that? So the, the process for recovery after traumatic brain injury has to do with plasticity uh, or neuroplasticity. Plasticity mm -hmm. is the mechanism the brain has to, to reconnect or to repair or to rewire itself after an injury. So the, the good ne neurons that are there uh, intact, they start making new connections in between and taking over functions before that they were done by the other cells that probably uh, suffered the, the trauma. And uh, this process of plasticity is enhanced by repetition. So the more you perform a task, mm -hmm. more connections you build in the brain and the better it gets. This uh, recovery process or plasticity process takes uh, weeks or even a couple of months after the injury. Ideally, the first three months after the injury is when we see most of the recovery in the patients. Now, how do you figure out what the predictors of outcome are? Predictors of outcome uh, in traumatic brain injury are several widely used uh, indicators of severity in the acute mm -hmm. uh, brain injury setting. And uh, basically, we use a lot of uh, scales with different uh, scores uh, that are uh, indicators of, of severity, mild, moderate, or uh, severe. We have three mainly indicators uh, for severity of injury, and those are one, loss of consciousness, and the other one is the post-traumatic amnesia. So what the patients recall or don't recall uh, after the accident. Right. The longer the duration of consciousness, the longer the, the post-traumatic amnesia, uh, the lower the prognosis or the poor the prognosis for recovery. Mm -hmm. Also, the age overall is one of the best indicators for recovery. The younger, 
the better. So the younger recover a lot better than the older patients. A lot patients. better because, you know, remember patients when they are older, they have more um, other conditions mm -hmm. associated with their status that probably make it a little bit harder for them to recover. Now, this doesn't happen in the pediatric population. In the pediatric population, the very small, the very young, probably have uh, the worst prognosis because their brains are very, very immature, so they're more vulnerable to, to the injury. Right. Now, I want you to take us through a state of, of consciousness, uh, doctor, for someone with a traumatic brain injury. So what are we seeing? So this is the classification for mild, moderate, and severe, and we have pretty much one is radiology findings in mild. We, you have normal CT or MRIs of the brain. And uh, you have a loss of consciousness that can be up to 30 minutes. Okay. In moderate and severe, you have some findings or abnormalities in the CT or MRIs of the brain. And the duration of this loss of consciousness is going to be more. Uh, of course, in the moderate, and then more than 24 hours. In the severe, I will probably add as well the post-traumatic amnesia that has a couple of durations as well to classify in mild, moderate, or severe the traumatic brain injury. So how much brain function is lost in the severe? So the severe, uh, basically when you have a, tra a severe traumatic brain injury, patients most of the time uh, are in coma, what we call, which is the okay. more primitive a state of consciousness. So level of consciousness are in the very inner parts of the brain and the cortex. And uh, those uh, areas are the ones that keep us awake, to say it somehow. And when you are, have a patient in coma, like what happens in a severe traumatic brain injury, patients are not going to be um, arousable. They have no awareness of anything. And, uh, and most of the time when patients are more than six hours in a coma state, the mortality is going to be increased. Wow. Those patients that evolve from that state of coma, they're going to move to another state that is called vegetative state. When they are in vegetative state, patients are um, awake. They can be arousable. They are arousable, but they don't have awareness of the environment at all. And then we have a more uh, higher or, or a higher uh, level of, of uh, consciousness, which is called the minimal conscious state. Minimal. Uh, conscious. Minimal okay. conscious state, where, where the patient is arousable. He has some awareness of the environment. He can follow some simple commands. And he can have some visual also uh, tracking. And then you have when the patient is totally alert. Okay. Now what happens in, when it's mild traumatic brain injury most of the time. So let's go over some of the moderate to severe deficits from a brain injury. Uh, the first one being the, your attention span, correct? So the attention, yes, the attention uh, goes actually related to the amnesia or the mm -hmm. capacity to uh, retain uh, some information and to remember. Concentration, distractibility, uh, memory as well that goes with the attention and uh, thinking process, confusion, those are going to be uh, somehow affected in the moderate uh, traumatic brain injury and of course even more affected when it's a severe uh, trauma to the brain. Is it true that cognitive brain exercises like maybe doing word games or crossword puzzles, they help? Uh, patients with brain traumatic, uh, traumatic the, brain injuries? They do, and actually cognitive rehabilitation is, uh, is a huge area in, in rehabilitation. We work together with the speech therapists and neuropsychologists uh, for uh, cognitive rehabilitation in the moderate and severe traumatic brain injuries with the use of different tools um, to help them uh, with, uh, with the cognitive aspects. Can you walk us through what it's like for a patient after they've had their injury? So it's very challenging, it's very frustrating also for the patients and for the families. That's why uh, we need to do as part of our evaluation and approach to the patient uh, to give a lot of education and guidance to the family members because it's a, it's a totally new situation for them, not only physically, but mentally, emotional and it's going to affect their daily living as well as their job positions. 
Uh, so it's, it's, it's a process, that is, it's a long process, but most of right. the time uh, patients uh, get, uh, the good thing is that they get much better. And a, a multidisciplinary approach is crucial when it comes to patients with a traumatic brain injury. So can you give us some examples, doctor, of different medical professionals you would work with yes. for a traumatic brain injury? So we work with different disciplines, uh, physiatrists uh, like myself. Uh, uh, we have uh, disciplines such as the physical therapies, occupational. The nursing staff is extremely helpful for the bladder and bowel problems and skin protection. Uh, we have uh, dietitians as well, neuropsychology, social worker is very important uh, upon discharge of the patient, mainly to be able to um, uh, provide the patient with different um, tools and equipment that they might need for home. And I will probably add as well the recreational therapist uh, who is in charge of the community reentry skills for those patients. Mm -hmm. What about equipment to use for that rehabilitation for a patient with a traumatic brain injury? So the injury? equipment, we determine it, uh, the equipment at the end of their hospital stay upon discharge. Once they go home, we provide, we work with social workers mm -hmm. mainly, and the therapist to be able to provide patients with uh, like a hospital bed, um, helps uh, or tools for the bathroom, for their uh, daily living activities, such as the grooming, the bathing, the dressing, uh, if they need a wheelchair, if they need a walker, depending on their level of um, ambulation. Uh, so there's different type of, of equipment that we can um, provide to these patients. And as far as the goal for the patient, do you sit down with the patient or the team sits down with the patient to discuss maybe those short-term goals and maybe long-term goals of recovery? Yes, so when we are in the hospital, we try to manage short-term go short -term goals, uh, maybe week by week. Uh, the long-term goals are probably more uh, managed in the outside setting when we see the patient every month or every three months. Right. Uh, because it depends, like an example of a short-term goal could be, okay, uh, the patient is gonna be able to feed by himself maybe next week. Uh, but a long-term goal probably is going to be the patient might be able in two months to go back to a part-time job, let's say. Right. Now coming up, we continue to focus on the importance of rehab and how family members and friends can help. So stay tuned. You're watching the Health Channel. All health, all the time on South Florida PBS. If you have a question, please call in now using the toll-free number 855-796-4475. And remember, you can take the Health Channel wherever you go by visiting our website, allhealthtv.com. You can watch a Health Channel live stream or check out videos from previous episodes like this one. We'll be right back. Stuck in traffic? There's an easier way to see a doctor, right from your phone. Download the Baptist Health Care On Demand app today to enroll for free. Hey there, so what's going on today? Can you open wide for me, buddy? Okay, I see what's happening. Care On Demand from Baptist Health, the better way to get better. Every year, millions of Americans are exposed to a contagious virus. What is this virus? It's stigma. Stigma promotes an environment of shame, fear, and silence, which prevents millions of people from seeking help. But there's good news. The National Alliance on Mental Illness believes stigma towards mental illness is 100% curable. So do yourself and everyone a favor. Go to curestigma.org and get tested for stigma. Cancer. We don't want to think about it, but I had to. Because you see, I was, I was traveling, I was enjoying life, I was working. It was too long since my last pap. When I was finally tested, we thought I might have cervical cancer. After worrying, no cancer. I was lucky. Women, please get a pap test to check for cervical cancer and get the inside knowledge about gynecologic cancers for you and the people who care about you.
Is your weight getting in the way of daily tasks? Does life just seem harder and harder? Health risks from excess weight or obesity can be serious. We've tried to make changes to lose weight. We're just getting older. It's more than that. I know what we can do. Visit yourweightmatters.org for free resources to help you prepare to meet with your health care provider or easily find a provider. Your weight does matter. Visit yourweightmatters.org and start improving your health today. Welcome back to the Health Channel, all health, all the time. I'm Kathy Buccio, and we're talking about traumatic brain injury with Dr. Lucinda Adriana Arenas, a physical medicine and rehabilitation physician at Baptist Health South Florida. I want to remind our viewers to call with your questions. The toll-free number is 855-796-4475. You still got time. Now, while rehab can help patients manage a new lifestyle, it also helps prevent complications. So can you talk about the common complications your team might help prevent? Yes, so patients after traumatic brain injury can present a significant number of complications. And the purpose of our team is to try to prevent these complications actually from happening. So bladder and bowel uh, incontinence is one of the things that these patients face with uh, nursing. We work with uh, programs, bladder and um, bowel programs to try to retrain uh, the bladder and the bowel in order to get patients again. But why remember, do they have that to begin with? Why do they have bladder and bowel problems? Well, because those centers that manage the bladder and the bowel are connected somehow to brain uh, areas uh, also that can be injured in the, from the accident. So they can have problems with bladder and bowel that put them in embarrassing situations as well and more problems to the skin because of the maceration. Um, and so they're gonna have skin problems eventually because of so the incontinence. So they are putting these programs to retrain bladder and bowel. Uh, skin and nutrition, nutrition is extremely important in these patients because uh, the, the, the skin needs uh, good nutrition, also the bones to prevent osteoporosis. Patients who lack mobility they tend to uh, have more osteoporosis. So nutrition is a very important aspect and we work with uh, dietitians on the floors to try to avoid these complications uh, for the skin and for, the, um, for, for um, mineral loss in the mm -hmm. bones. Medications in these patients, we try to avoid uh, unnecessary medications that might put patients on more uh, agitation and confusion states. So we avoid medications as possible. Sometimes we need to give uh, a few medications just to try to improve their, their attention and concentration so they can uh, have a better performance during the therapy sections. Uh, they have endocrinology abnormalities because also through the, because of the brain injury, there's a, a lot of uh, endocrinologi endocrinological um, alterations in the brain and patients might present um, it's sort of uh, diabetes mm -hmm. and other conditions that are endocrinology related. Right. Agitation and seizures, we call the post-traumatic uh, seizures that could present early or even late and might need medications also in the very acute periods and agitation. This is why we try to avoid overstimulation in these patients because the overstimulation can cause the agitation. In more agitation and more confusion. Right. 
Now, what are the goals for rehabilitation? Does that change from patient to patient? It tends from patient to patient because uh, every patient is different, every patient has different deficits, every family is different as well. We like to hear not only the goals that the patient might have, but also the goals that the family might have, and the goals that we have as, 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 as treating physicians. You know, so we put all this on the table and we try to proceed with when, but it looks to be better for the patient. But overall, we try to improve quality of life, we try to uh, bring back the patient to their previous level of function and you know, recovery as, as soon as possible, as, as much as we can. So can you explain the difference between inpatient and outpatient? Does the services or the outcomes change because you're in one rather than the other? Well, inpatient rehab is considered to be acute rehabilitation for patients uh, where they are in the hospital, actually in the rehabilitation floor, having intensive uh, therapy from all the disciplines, physical, occupational, speech, recreational therapy, every day, six days a week, for three hours during the day. So it's very intensive, in the morning at night. Mm -hmm. When they are ready to be discharged home, they will continue what we call outpatient uh, rehabilitation, and this is basically going to be given three times per day, three times per, three days per week, per week I'm sorry, um, with all the disciplines as well. And uh, they're going to have probably home evaluations as well to make sure that the patients can perform at home uh, efficiently. And uh, these are the main difference from inpatient and outpatient therapy. I mean, that's a lot to undertake for family or for someone who just had a traumatic brain injury. Does mm -hmm. insurance cover all these services? Is there someone to help the family and the patient navigate the system? Insurances cover all, it depends on the insurance, but most insurances cover the services, uh, inpatient and, and, and outpatient. For inpatient, uh, it's a week to week uh, process with insurances. You know, they, 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 they want to see progress in the patient, of course. Uh, so the more progress the patient makes, probably the more uh, extensive the rehabilitation coverage is going to be for them. So how successful are today's uh, rehabilitation programs? Is the outcome higher in t from times past? I think it's higher. Uh, we try to uh, make the hospitalization uh, shorter mm -hmm. each time. To, to get you back to your life as quickly as possible. To get him back as quickly as possible. So I think it's, uh, it's uh, the acute rehabilitation process for this patient, I think is amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, because it's, it's, uh, it has improved tremendously in, in the last few years, I guess. I think it's so important as well to involve friends and family in mm -hmm. this rehabilitation process. Have you seen firsthand, doctor, how this improves the outcome for patients? Absolutely, that's very important. Uh, we educate patients initially to avoid overstimulation as we were talking before because a few years ago, uh, the idea for the family member wa was, uh, you know, were to, to give a lot of stimulation to the patient, to show them a lot of things, to talk to them a lot of things. But that's not the case now. We want to uh, have the patient in a more uh, quiet environment, at least the first few days, just to bring down all you know, the potentials for or the, or the triggers for uh, irritability and confusion and agitation. And then little by little, eventually, we're going to introduce all those different um, areas to the patient. Uh, but family, family members and friends are uh, extremely important in the rehabilitation process of these patients. So what are ways that families and friends can be supportive? What can they do? Uh, well, of course, visiting patients, you know, um, talking to them in a non-stressful way, probably trying to uh, bring uh, some memories, nice memories, back to the patients. Right. Uh, bring in a couple of, they can bring them a couple of few things that they were probably were missing from home that might be able to give them some good memories as well and uh, be involved as much as possible in the training that all the staff is going to give them before they go home. So they are really prepared for this new challenge once they are out of the hospital. And I think as well to be patient and to be maybe gentle 
Absolutely. So many changes are going on, and this patient is going through not only through physical, but motion, mental and emotional mental and emotional, changes. And yes, and, and the job as well. More, a lot of patients, when they are, they feel better, they show a lot of, uh, you know, concerns about, about the job, and this is where uh, vocational rehab actually uh, comes into place to help patients probably to uh, incorporate a slow to their right. to their previous jobs if it's possible, or probably to look for alternatives and other options if maybe if maybe they are not able to go back to their previous jobs because uh, of the deficits that right. they have now. But that support is so important. Exactly. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Dr. Arenas, for being here Thanks. on the show Thanks today. Thanks for having me again. Be sure to join us next time on the Health Channel. All health all the time on South Florida PBS. And follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter using the hashtag AllHealthTV. And please be sure to visit our website, AllHealthTV.com, where you can watch a Health Channel live stream and watch videos from previous episodes. I'm Kathy Buccio. We'll see you next time.